Hello, hello everybody and hello. welcome to our Friday Night Live. We have got a treat for you tonight because we've got the legend that is Vince McNally, also known as Vince the Vet. And um, we're going to be chatting about natural ways to support a dog with pain and discomfort. Um, but I will let I let Vince kind of introduce himself because he's kind of he's he's well, he, not he's a legend to me. He's a god to me. He knows that because those that don't know, um, he it was actually um, he pretty much saved my dog's life. What six years ago now, Vince? Is yeah, it? yeah. And he's nine now. So, and if it wasn't for him, I, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have Ron today. He would have been long gone, probably about four or five years old. So, so Vince, do you want to kind of give an overview of of, of what you do, so everybody knows who you are? Um, be just before that, I, I can still remember vividly uh, Ron knocking my glasses on the floor covering me in slobber and me having to throw my trousers away when I got home because <laughs> there was that much gunk on them. You but, got uh, the full run experience that day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> top dog. Um, yeah, um, oh gosh, trying to think back now. 40 years this year since I qualified as a vet. Uh, uh, very quick potted history. 10 years as a conventional vet. Bought, bought my own practice uh, after I'd been qualified for three years, working for PDF, PDSA for three years. Thought I knew enough and uh, probably did, actually. <laughs> Specialised in orthopaedics for, for for about three years. Um, after 10 years, got more and more frustrated with uh, doling out the same old medication. You know, uh, if there's inflammation, you gave steroids or something similar. If there was infections, you give antibiotics. If surgery was needed, you do the surgery. And really, you know, after five years in veterinary college and what have that that was basically it. And it still hasn't changed that much, actually, apart from throwing in uh, prescriptions diets. And and I remember I remember Hill's Pet Food ringing us up to join a, a consultation group. And that's another story, you know, what we're <laughs> in this country. So I just really got fed up and, and wanted to look for alternatives. I always like finding solutions. And I, I couldn't believe that this amazing thing called the body and the animal's body, our own body, didn't have the capacity to heal itself, given their eye stimulus and support, the right key to unlock extraordinary things. And I'd read a load of, book, a load of books at those times. There was a book by Michael Talbot called Holographic Universe. And some amazing things, uh, stories documented throughout history about major transformations. And one, one thing, I mean, I don't want to stray too far from this, but one thing that really stuck in my mind was, um, you know, this kind of multiple personality disorder syndrome where uh, you'd have one personality would be diabetic. And then within seconds of another personality coming to the fore, the diabetes had gone, literally gone, you know, medical impossibility, eyes changing color from brown to blue and back again, things which you know, scientifically can't happen, but did in documented individuals, you know. So I thought there must be ways of, of helping the dog to heal themselves, helping pets to heal themselves, rather than kind of jumping in and giving drugs, which, you know, uh, very often are just a temporary kind of fix. So that started a whole process which lasted, it always lasts till today. But initially it, it involved studying acupuncture and, and traditional Chinese herbal medicine and homeopathy uh, and um, various other things. And uh, not just here, but uh, I went to the States, I went to Thailand, I went to China um, and uh, Sri Lanka, various other places, looking at, um, at the indigenous uh, natural forms of therapy, which go back, some of these go back 4,000 years, like Ayurveda, for example, in India. Uh, so th th this is not new, you know, everything's, it's not new under the sun, everything is remarketed, if you like. So I, I learned a lot about my own health and, and friends and family's health during that, that point. And we started to, um, I was lucky because it was my own practice, so I could do what I liked. So I started introducing um, various nutritional blends to help pets that were suffering from chronic skin disease and various other diseases. Uh, and uh, initially, I started to go with the uh, existing texts like called peppers and this kind of stuff, but it wasn't working. You know, although I was using uh, herbs that were indicated for conditions and what, I, 
weren't really making a big difference because that's it's it, it's a it's a difficult place to be in because you're charging money for a consultation so there's an expectation that at least you're going to have some positive impact even in chronic cases and that just wasn't happening so we had to start almost for with a clean slate and think oh, okay how can we do this that and the other so over a long period um probably it took about um five years before we were starting to get reasonable results um and i studied uh, a form of energy field therapy at the time as well that's that's another story that was published in the vet times it's probably not even online now uh, but we came up with formulations that would consistently start to help pets so instead of one out of ten pets it, it became four out of ten pets and now with the supplement range that we've produced and the remedy we've produced behind which all comes from direct clinical experience the success rate is, is uh, well over 80 to 90 percent in most cases even for chronic diseases. Um, I mean, we have an almost 100% success rate with IBD, chronic skin disease, 90, 90%, reducing itch, you know, all the rest of it. So um, that's that's kind of a very brief, you know, um, synopsis. Yeah. Missed out a lot of failures and lots of ups and downs, which is inevitable when you kind of try to um, forge, forge new ground, you know. Um, but Absolutely. It's trial and success at the end of the day, isn't it? Pardon? It's trial and success at the end of the day. You've, you've got to kind of, you know, go through a few things to to, to find the right the right key to un unlock, um, you know, your path forward, basically. So, but I mean, obviously, the underpinning as well of what you do is addressing a dog's diet as well, and 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 starting to kind of like, you know, cure the dog from the inside out. Make sure that the building blocks are there first, and then adding in kind of like other things like your your remedies and your with the other things and supplements that you have there as well so it, it's 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 looking at everything it's not just kind of um putting a stopper in things like you said kind of like short-term fixes you, you're actually working on long-term fixes long-term gain as it were in order to to you know improve the dog's overall life not just kind of the the, the issue that they might have presented with you to you at the time so yeah yeah uh, that's a really good point actually Jeremy. you're uh, on that point um Nutrition is everything, you know. You, uh, I, I kind of skimmed over that, but we we first started. I mean, we were promoting raw food dying long before any ninety five percent of the companies that exist today existed, and raw food groups and all the rest of it. And we we, we recognise that. So I, my my dad, dad used to race and, and breed greyhounds for you know. I know people vary on that, but as a kid growing up, you know, I, I just had a house full of dogs which I loved, and they were they were fed you know with raw food and what have you. So that was natural to me. So when this journey started and we wanted to try and help chronic cases. You know, the first thing we did, you've got to get your dog on a species appropriate raw diet, you know, which is their bodies are evolutionary designed for. That's the building blocks, because unless you've got that as a foundation, everything else is limited. So it doesn't matter if you give remedies to stimulate healing or you do this, that and the other. It doesn't matter what kind of therapy you do to stimulate the body. It's like trying to build a house without the bricks. You can tell you can you can tell the workmen to put a put that house up and you want it to do this that, and the other. And they stood around waving their hands. They haven't got the bricks to do it, or they've got some bricks, but they haven't got all the bricks. It's the same with diet. You re you need a complete balanced diet. Yeah. Uh, that's key. But also the, th the 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 third element, which is often missed out and is so vital today because we see so much of it, it's got to be right for that dog. Everything's individual, and I know Gem is big on this. You know, as much I I wish there was a cure all for everything for every case we see, but I have to start again with every single dog, as though I've not seen that condition before. You know, and draw on the tools that match you to that dog. And diet is exactly the same. You know, Absolutely. what's right for me, food wise, is not. You know, could be dreadful for the person next. Same for dogs. So it's really important when you're creating, you're looking at nutrition as the foundation of health, is that that dog gets what that dog needs you know and um it means building it up it means not throwing everything at a dog it, it means one brick at a time meat supplement weight what's the body doing next supplement and so you're gradually building up a jigsaw you know of a complete diet one nutrient at a time one one food nutritional food at a time sorry not one nutrient but one food um, yeah and that that is that's the found out until you get that right Everything else is limited. There's a break on it.
Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, you know, having that, that underpinning of, of a good diet for that, for, for a dog is actually can be quite pivotal with um, the diseases that we see today. So like osteoarthritis, you know, having a, a diet that's species appropriate, that animal cutting out a lot of the processed foods that, that we see on the market today. Vince, it lowers inflammation, doesn't it, within the body, having a, a, a decent diet, and a diet that works for that dog is is a no processed food is going to help to lower inflammation within the body inflammation within those joints right got to. Uh, absolutely first first of all you process the life force out of it i mean it might be chemically resemble food but the life energy is out of it um second thing is the, the it, it's but it's completely on its head carnivores are built to digest large amounts of protein smaller amounts of fat and then a tiny little bit of carbohydrates. And that's reflected in the profile of the pancreatic enzymes that are produced. And what's the pet food industry done? Flipped it completely on its head. So uh, there's, there's a Burns food, for example. I'll take, pick one example because we were just we, we put that in the Helping My Etchy Dog course a few weeks ago. We were, we were showing profiles of food and, and looking at how it creates problems. And there's a Burns food. It's over 50% carbohydrates. Now, those carbohydrates are broken down into sugars in the body. Those sugars fuel yeast infections in the mm -hmm. gut, in the skin, down the ears, in the bum, anal, so everywhere. You know, so it, it's it's completely wrong, completely unhealthy. So yeah. that needs to come out. You need to get back to the protein, fats, vitamins and minerals, trace elements, and a tiny, if if, if any, carbohydrates. You know, I think dogs would do great on a keto diet too all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the thing i always say that we're all made up of the same stuff animals humans but we're just packaged in a different bow basically in, in a different different shiny suit you know and you know we're, we're always told about eating a healthy diet with regards to humans and you know it, it lowers your, your cancer rate and and things like that obviously along with combination with that diet and exercise but it makes sense to make sure that obviously your animals are being fed appropriate food for them as well, you know, and, and, and not processed food. So it's always struck me as being completely baffling how, you know, in like the, the NHS and in the human world, we say fresh food, you know, eat lots of green vegetables and that obviously because humans do need more vegetables and than meat. And, but, you know, with dogs, it's like, well, no, let's feed them this highly processed dried food with god knows how many chemicals in it and and that's the best diet for them it, it's always baffled me um and like you i grew up in a house full of dogs they were show dogs and my mum fed raw food from i mean I, that's all i've known since the age of, of, of six is 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 raw food and none of them had arthritis at all hmm. that they, they they none of them did yeah. so it's got to show it's got to tell you something you know, and they were living in well into their their teens. You know, for for uh, for, for the, the the breeders' dogs that dogs that we were. So, yeah, hugely important and baffling, really, really baffling. Well, yeah, I was actually ch chatting to somebody um, on the phone yesterday about this, and and uh, they were saying, well, you know, how, how is the veterinary profession the way it is? Um, going back in my day, you know, when Adam was a lad, it was a trip to Melton Mowbray to, to Pedigree Pet Foods, you know, and there was only three or four brands on the market. There's Pedigree Chum and Bonio and Chappie and oh, Chappie, you know, yeah, Chappie, <laughs> good old Chappie, you know, you knew when Chappie yeah. was in the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled like a bad out outbreak of thrush, didn't it? You know? oh. <laughs> but, um, I, I yeah, I skived off that, but that that at that point, Pedigree Pet Foods were sponsoring courses and and, you, and even the folder that we got in veterinary school was, you know, Waltham Institute on the front. This so, so there were ties yeah. between the veterinary profession and commercial pet food manufacturers at that point, but it's got ten times worse now, if not more. You know, with the Royal Canines and Hills and all the rest of it. You know, um, big big money, billions of pounds. Things you know, very close relationship between them, and because so 
when when vets go in, you've got to have a curious mind to go in and become a vet in the first place. Otherwise, you, you know, you wouldn't make the effort to get the grades and yeah. you wouldn't have the affinity for animals. But it, it, it's kind of tram lined out, you know, as as the, as vets go through college, you know, that the focus becomes narrower and narrower, more and more conventional and everything's reduced to kind of it's it's scientific building blocks and you know and it kind of lose you you know most vets lose that um yeah. so when they come out they can't literally see anything other than hills and royal cannon and scientifically balanced diet nor but they're not looking looking at the ingredients you know and, and looking at the spectrum of diseases you know and yeah. it's like um you know if you ever look on twitter you know and you see this dog you know where uh, that there used to be a door and the glass has come out, you, you know, and, and they won't go through it because they're expecting to hit the glass window, yeah. you know, and even though it's not there. And it's like this with vets, you know, they come out, they're intelligent people, but they most, the majority lose the ability to look at that bag and think, dear God, you know, would I eat that every day and think that I'm doing the best for me and my body? I mean, you, you wouldn't, yeah. would you? You wouldn't do it yourself. Yeah. And yet it, they, they're kind of mentally... You know befuddled in a sense and can't see so in a sense it's not so much that the vets are nasty people you know which sometimes gets kind of bandied around so it's a fact that they've just become so conditioned by the training that they've had and then it's reinforced afterwards that they're doing the right thing yeah and you put that vet then in i'll come off this in a second but you put that vet then in a in a practice that's run yeah. by, you know, the CEO is of the CVS group used to manage, uh, manage Vision Expresses. I mean, 500 plus veterinary practice, and they've got uh, sales targets for food, vaccines, wormers, fleas. And what chance have you got of walking in with your pet saying, I feel raw food? And I'm going, Well done. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And that's why, unfortunately, it, it's just conditioning. Yeah, it's, 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 it's it comes from like education level down, doesn't it? Really, and, yeah. and like you say, yeah. conditioning. You know, you hear enough of it, um, and it it seeps in, doesn't it? I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, obviously, there are people like you uh, and other other vets that are kind of like breaking that mold and, and now kind of talking about this a, a lot more um, and, and trying to get the message out there, which is absolutely fantastic. The but world. The biggest, needs in, the biggest is, impetus is coming from pet parents. You know, yeah. kind of thinking, well, you know, gosh, this can't be right, and asking questions, which is great. You know, um, yeah. and, that, yeah. that's where it's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. They need to. They need to ask more, massively more. Definitely. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So, let's move on to kind of like some more, some more kind of like how we can naturally support our dogs. Um, so, I thought I'd I'd kind of just dip into what exactly pain is. So, I, I kind of looked up. Um, in the British Pain Society, guys, and you can you can see this, it's the BritishPainSociety.org and what is pain. So just to clarify, in July 2020, the IASP, or that's the International Association for the Study of Pain, uh, re revised the definition of pain, and that is as follows. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And um, they do go into a, a couple of um, factors, one of which I thought was really, really interesting. It said verbal description is, the is only one of several behaviours to express pain. Inability to communicate does not negate the possibility that a human or non-human animal experiences pain. And I thought, that was actually, you know, the an association for human pain is recognizing that a non-animal, a non-human animal can actually experience pain, but won't necessarily vocalize it. So there, there are other ways of of kind of looking for for pain, um, which obviously is what dynamic dog does. Um, and obviously, as part of dynamic dog, I talk about specific pain medications that conventional vets are going to to issue however there's 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 more that we can do um obviously some conventional medicines are inevitable and we do have to reach for those in in you know severe cases but there's lots that can be done isn't there Vince that that means that um maybe you don't have to reach for those conventional meds straight from the off 
um, that you can add specific supplements. Um, you can change diet as well, which is what we've just talked about. Um, but but what can you do? So should, should we, I mean, the, the kind of main culprits out there for pain medications are your, your metacams and loxicoms, um, your gabapentin, your galaprant, um, and um, crikey, Onzior, I could go off on a, on a whole list. But from obviously, we're looking at a, a chronic disease here. So the likes of arthritis, and things like that. Um, you know, prevention is better than cure here. So where would you start, Vince, with, with kind of maybe a dog that's presenting to you with with maybe some I don't know, arthritic joints or starting to have de uh, degenerative joint disease? Get the right teeth in, Hudson. So where would you start? Um, first thing, I mean, I mean this, this is one of the common things we're asked about. And, and the first thing I, I say to people who email in, now this isn't, you know, this is on a, a mass scale. This is not on a kind of seeing pets on an individual scale is we suggest that they go on our joint supplement now i'm not here to bring any of our products but i'll explain why what's in it is in it and why it makes such a difference so when um because i specialize in orthopedics for three years when, when we came to look to support joint um comfort more than any else that was available um i i, I wanted something that targets every aspect of the joint so I wanted something that would improve the viscosity uh, and nutrient carrying capacities of the synovial fluid, for example, because the synovial fluid is crucial for keeping cartilage healthy because cartilage is a vascular. So the nutrients have to come from the joint capsule into the joint fluid and there. So the, the viscosity of um, joint fluid is really important. Um, as dogs get older or they get degenerative joint problems or various other diseases, it becomes thinner. So it becomes more like water as opposed to engine oil. So that was a that's a key component of keeping the joints healthy and a dog mobile and pain free in movement. Uh, the next thing I wanted to look at was, OK, we, we need to support all the sporting structures as well. So um, we need to make sure that the joint capsule, the fibrous tissues in the joint capsule, the tendons and ligaments which hold the, the joint in the correct alignment are all nice and strong, but also flexible because they tend to tighten up and become more brittle and as they get older, you know, so um, so that was really important. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, bone density was good, you know, that there wasn't weakening of, de of, of bone or fissures or fractures appearing in the, the, the little trabecular, you, you know, you, uh, as course participants, you know all this, a little, beautiful little trabeculae underneath the cartilage, which kind of like cathedral archways, aren't they? You know, just create this incredible weight bearing structures, you know, from, from minerals. They need to be good and healthy. Otherwise you can get fractures. You can get little pieces of cartilage splitting and coming off and floating around the joint. And then you set into, into motion like a snowball effect where everything starts to become more and more painful and stiff and what have you. So, so we wanted all these different areas uh, uh, targeted and nourished, basically. Um, and we had to make sure that there were vitamins, minerals and trace elements in which all the cells that compose these, compose these different structures had the nutrients they needed to function uh, optimally. Uh, so we we put in, and it's a unique formulation. It's, it's not mimic grinding out there. Now, before I just expand on that, I, I was using glucosamine and chondroitin for anybody else in the UK. I'm going back 25 years ago. Um, I went to a conference called What Doctors Don't Tell You, where, where Lynn Mataget, which she held it in London, and uh, they produced a great magazine which was publishing kind of uh, cutting edge research on these various things uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and I spied this, uh, this use of chondroitin and glucosamine for arthritis in people and found that people were becoming more and more comfortable and, and less and less painful. So we started to use it in dogs and it definitely helps. You know, it, 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 it's a big plus. But like anything that develops over time, there are much better kind of supplements around now because chondroitin and, sulfur, sul, uh, chondroitin, uh, and glucosamine largely nourish the cartilage, but they don't do anything for these other structures that I've just yeah. mentioned. So what we did is, is, is instead of, using chondroitin and glucosamine, we, we broadened the, the uh, nutritional building block range that was supplied. So hydrolyzed collagen provides the building blocks for every part of, of the joints, not just the cartilage. Hyaluronic acid thickens the uh, lubricating oil. 
and, and increases the moisture retention of the cartilage so it remains subtle, shock absorbery instead of brittle. This is why it's in high-end cosmetics because ladies put it on their face and, and they act like microscopic sponges, keeping the skin youthful looking and, and plump. Um, the kelp, organic kelp was for all the vitamins, minerals, trace elements for the different cells to function properly. And then we include bromelain, which is, I'm not aware of being in any else, which has natural anti-inflammatory properties. It's from pineapples. And that combination uh, is, there's no better supplement for nourishing the joints. You know, um, you move, I know, you, I'm not going to diss other brands, but you move largely uses um, green nut muscle, uh, which is there for its chondroitin glucosamine and essential fatty acids. So again, it's very, very much linked to helping the anti-inflammatory pathways, which is not restoring a joint uh, and then, focusing on the cartilage, you know, and that's general. We, that's kind of, we stand out. So we generally say that and it works, it works in 92% of cases, a dog will, you know, show significant improvements within a week or two. Uh, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't take months, literally within a week or two. Um, so that's the first thing we, 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 we suggest if there's still room for improvement after a month with nutrition, with that nutritional support, then we say try a uh, try a remedy that we produce, which is joint support. Now, these are botanical remedies, which um, these are different from nutritional building blocks. This is if this these stimulate and support. It's like it's like giving the workers building a house cups of tea and giving the you know or a boot up the bum or encouraging mm -hmm. that it, it may. It's, they're still the same workers, so the body's natural repair processes are the same, but they work different. Like a catal it catalyzes, you know, like an enzyme set to, to, to get them to work better, you know. And I mean, a lady, funny enough, a lady, a lady emailed. She's got a horse. She's she's putting the horse on them because it works great in horses. These and and she said, how many drops to give? And I said, just one or two. And she couldn't believe. It. She said, what? Why? Why is it the same dose for a horse as it is for a? you know, for a chihuahua. And I said, well, you've got to think of it. It's, it's like it's like a, a, a little bird landing on a particular spot on a mountaintop and setting off an avalanche. The right stimulus in the right place to body that creates the effect, not the amount that you're giving. So this is where yeah. the remedies differ from, um, from the nutritional building blocks. One's the material substance and the other is the the stimulus and information to make the body work better, you know. And the two, the combination of the two works for pretty much a long time in um, ninety percent, ninety percent plus of dogs. Um, yeah. And then we only move on to the next stage work because inevitable, as as if there's advanced pathology, dogs start living till seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. You know, they've got other health. Uh, conditions which affect the joints, you know, they're not absorbing the nutrients from the gut, you know, or they've got to chew, all that, all this kind of thing. There's this increased utilization of nutrients elsewhere in the body, so there's less left available for joints, then they will inevitably get get worse. And that's when we move yeah. into, well, okay, what what other things as opposed to nutrients and, and natural remedies can can help? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Because obviously, look, we, it's not just the the presenting condition that you end up treating, like you say, actually due to compensatory processes, and obviously the dog shifting weight around the body. You then end up actually treating, say, if the dog's got an issue with his left hind, you end up treating, you know, predominantly the right fore and and kind of partly the the left fore as well, because the dog will just shift weight around his body to to compensate for the fact that the right hind isn't isn't you know, or the, sorry, the left hind isn't doing the job that it was supposed to do. So you end up in this vicious cycle of of, of basically tr playing, well, playing catch up with a lot of the time with, with, you know, where the pain is and, and you know, having that underpinning of kind of like food, then your supplements and then other things that you can add onto that, as you say, kind of like causes that cascade effect, that domino effect and, and, and helps the body to, not necessarily heal itself but but go a, a long way to kind of improving conditions within joints and 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 you know specific yeah. areas anyway so amazing I, we've got i'm glad you said that because I've, I've missed a really important bit out which i kind of i skip over because we've already done we mentally i've already done it but i haven't said it um and and that's be, before we give advice on on anything like that we make sure that they've been to the vet and been thoroughly examined you know um, 
I don't want to be recommending a, a supplement to a dog that's that's about to spit out a, a calcified disc into its spine or, you know, the, the, that kind of thing. So it's really important to make sure the vet has been involved and they've done their job in screening for things which could be medical emergencies or could be that's serious it. kind of spinal issues, uh, wh whether it's whether it's muscular, skeletal or vascular or whatever. So we always make sure that there isn't something that needs urgent treatment or surgery and that kind of thing so we always we always do that first before we move on to well what can be done with regards to natural support yeah, and absolutely. included in that are mechanical issues i mean jen has mentioned something which is really really kind of important because when you've got um misalignments in the skeleton which is far far more common than than anybody realizes apart from it's from everywhere the i go out of my house like this oh, <laughs> it's like and my students they get halfway through the course and like we see it everywhere it's like the sixth sense yeah. i see dead people yeah. it's like damaged dogs everywhere basically it, it's horrific well it's, so, it's it's like it's it's like whack-a-mole isn't it because you you only need a slight misarticulation anywhere in the spine and like a traffic jam on a motorway, somebody breaks and it ripples all the way back. You know, ten. And you're sat in a, you're sat in a traffic jam on the motorway for ten minutes. What the hell's going on? You know. And then you move, and there was nothing there. But it's, yeah. it's sort of ripple effect. So yeah. slight changes in any of the vertebrae down the back. You know, create. And once once those misarticulations have been created, the, the musculature, as you know, around the you know, frees it in position. So it becomes a chronic misalignment which then puts pressure on spinal nerves coming out so you can end up with gut issues if it's in the thoracolumbar region you can end up with defecatory and bladder issues if it happens to be lumbar sacral or, or quadriclina you know all and all that can start from having a you know somebody kind of you know giving a dog a thump on the back of the neck when it was young or whatever you you, you know Absolutely. So you're absolutely and right. Yeah, you've got to make the sure. The might have gotten up and, and shaken off, and you think, "Oh, there's you know nothing wrong," but you know it. It, it only takes a, a small kind of, and this, this is where chiro, McTimney chiropractors and osteopaths come into their own. And I'll, I'll get onto complementary therapies in a bit, but this, the, you know, just even a small, and it won't get picked up on X-ray. We're not talking about like a massive misalignment like that. We're talking like a hair's breadth, and due to the way fascia works and fascia is interwoven into everything it's in skin it's in bone it's in your 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 soft organs your vital organs it's in your intestines it's everywhere and just that hair's breadth of a misalignment can actually cause tension through the body and further uh, implications around the body and oh, this is just putting his two penneth worth in on that um, so so yeah it's it can be something as simple as you said vince as you know someone giving the dog a bit of a thump on the back or a bit of a rough pat or you know accidentally doing a, the dog doing a stretch and falling off the sofa and landing a bit funny you know it can have that knock-on effect and and you know you might not see it straight away, but when those compensatory processes kick in, and then those little things become the bigger things, and the bigger things, and the bigger things, uh, it, it, you know, and then before you know it, you've got body-wide issues going on, and and it, it's normally at that point that owners go, oh, there's something wrong, or somebody else, like a, a dynamic dog practitioner, or kind of one of the other complementary therapies, we're going to talk about, point something out, so. So, yeah, it's well, you've, it's, you've probably come across this, you know, where people have said, you know, since my dog had an anesthetic, he's never been right. And, he's, and this is that. Well, as you know, you, you 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 give an anesthetic to a dog, you're completely doing away with all the natural tone that that holds the confirmation in the correct alignment. So all those muscles are, are relaxed. You know, not, normally muscles aren't relaxed at all. Yeah, I mean, they, they can be relaxed, but there's still a tone keeping. So you take away that natural tone that keeps particularly the spinal column in, in its correct alignment, and that dog's getting moved around, twisted and turned and x-rayed. Then it comes round. You know, it will lock with these kind of vertebrae and, and, and other articulations out of position. And you, if you go, if 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 you listen when people are talking, you know, you're taking your history, you know, pe people volunteer. You know, he was 
I wish I'd never gone ahead with that x-ray. It's never been right. I had a lady this week saying exactly this thing. Yeah. I wish I'd never gone ahead with that anesthetic x-ray. It's never been right since. You know, yeah. so I, I kind of said, well, this is probably why. But again, it's it's a it's another, you know, it's a, it's another thing to bear in mind as to always looking for underlying cause. What set this off in the first place? You know, there's there's yeah. something set this in motion. And then yeah. unless it's corrected, it will carry on forever and a day. Exactly. Exactly. So guys, don't be don't be shy and kind of put your your questions to Vince. Um, just so you know, the lovely Jamie with Penelope. Um, who I originally put you in touch with. Uh, <laughs> She's been on and just said that you've you've completely changed her dog's life. Um, she went from lethargic and depressed to refusing uh, and refusing to eat to a happy, hungry, and playful hound. So, um, so she's been on singing your praises. Bless you. Um, another, another. Can I just say there on that that you know since since um, since we dealt with Penelope, we've had an absolute glut of dogs. You know, with with various kinds of pain, uh, uh, who have subsequently tested to have low folate and B12 in the gut, so it's secondary to small intestinal disease. Now, why it's we've had loads. It, it seems to be getting worse. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but it, it's creating gut pain, which then starts to come out in behaviours and anxiety, of course, gut brain axis, all the rest of it. You know, so it's really interesting. Um, yeah, notice yeah. that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I mean, I query whether or not it, it's down to generations of feeding not great food um, and, you know, things evolve. And are we, you know, evolving the dog's gut to kind of, you know, it's it screaming out something's not right. Something's not right. It, it, it's yeah. got to be pro, down to pro inflammatory foods. have got I've got to play a part. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, someone said finding Metacam and flat coat retrievers don't mix bad side effects. Yeah, um, you know, so Metacam doesn't suit all dogs, but, you know, it, it's down to, to owners to kind of ask questions of their vets. Is there anything else that that dog can go on, um, you know, that can actually uh, cause less side effects and hopefully no side effects at all, um, but it's never always the way. Um, so someone's asked, is it true? Uh, humans can take your supplements too. Apparently, a shop near me, um, where I live, sells your supplements and said people have taken them. Yeah, absolutely. They're all human food grade ingredients. So there's no difference between what you're buying in, in terms of the quality in, in Holland and Barrett or somewhere like that and what's in our supplements. Because again, we, we want to provide the best nutrition for pets buying animal ingredients never came into it it's buying the best quality ingredients that are available uh, available globally to do that and i mean we take the supplements ourselves you know the, our families are on them um it, it's remarkable but you know uh, Anne's uh, eldest brother uh, has has got um bad knees for he's been a, a gas company for decades you know and crawling around and all that and um He's one of the most skeptical people around, but a, a, a month or two on joints, and and, and he stopped moaning. He, he he hadn't even realised he'd stopped moaning about the state of his knees. He was just walking around normally. Same for lots of people, yeah. So, but all, all the products can be and are taken by people as well. Yeah, good good stuff. It is good stuff. I've used it for my dogs when they've needed it. So I thoroughly. It's, if I say it's tried and tested by Ron the British Bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> should have a like, stamp. <laughs> should, should have a Ron stamp. Definitely yeah. have a Ron stamp. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, that's, good. that's a good idea, Vince. I'm sure we can sort that out. Um, with the Ron dribble of approval. <laughs> you can just have like dribble over the top of your of your containers. Um, someone has actually said um uh the Vince the Vet joint supplement has been a game changer for their dog they've had 1300 pounds worth of tests at vet school with nothing conclusive found she's now running around uh scratching the ground after pooping and more playful oh, I have bought it friends as I'm such a firm believer thank you thank you thank you there you go that's a testimonial for you right there amazing um wondering what Vince's thoughts are regarding uh the increase in b12 deficiencies I think we we touched on that, didn't we? Yeah, it's it's not a deficiency of B twelve. You know, B B twelve. If you're feeding a if you're feeding a raw food diet or a home cooked diet or or there's meat in the diet and and eggs, 
there's plenty of b12 in the diet it's not it's not a deficiency of b12 it, it's it's an in, inability of the small intestine to absorb b12 from the food that's in the gut you know and uh, that can be due to a number of things but very often it's due to food sensitivities and intolerances so the the body is reacting towards that food as though it's uh, an invader or a toxin and it's creating an immune response. Bacterial overgrowth is another one. You know, if you get heavy populations of, of uh, bacteria in the small intestine, which shouldn't be there, yeah. they compete for B12 and, and can interfere with the uh, absorption. You know, there's a few other condition, medical conditions. Uh, but the biggest the, the biggest thing is, is that there's um, sensitivities and intolerance. Parasites can cause it too. Always screen for worms. Yeah, you do a worming um, screen. Yeah, yeah, every three months. Yeah. And uh, we, we get positive results every week. People seem to think that, you know, uh, it's quite rare, but it's not. No, it's not. It's not. We even had a heartworm positive last week. Oh, really? Oh, that's... Yeah, yeah, Allostrongus. And uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> we went to the vet and was told it's not in this country, you know. Well, the report showing a high infection there. So, well, clearly it we is. Send, we have some links showing, you know, the, the body that constantly monitors how strong this in the UK, you know, uh, has confirmed that it's present in high numbers, but we still wouldn't have it. So, the lady, had to, yeah, the, the lady had to, ended up going to another vet, you know. But, Crikey. Yeah. Crikey. Um, jo Carford, she is a dynamic dog graduate. Um, so she knows of your awesomeness, Vince. She's put my point is tummy issues are no longer, thanks to Vince McNally. There you oh, go. Yeah. Um, someone's asked, what would you recommend for reflux? I have a toy poodle that's fed on different dog uh fed on different dog cooked food. When is the reflux happening? Does the does the lady say? Uh, she doesn't know. Can you give us some more information and we'll we'll put that? Generally with reflux, uh, it'll, it'll settle down if you feed a, a small supper, you know. So so if you take kind of, you know, a, a quarter of the afternoon or evening meal, save it till supper and feed it just before you go to bed. Some some dogs' stomachs don't like to be empty overnight until, until the breakfast in the morning. Um, that would be the first thing. If that doesn't help, second thing is, is to give some of the stomach and bowel remedy because it promotes normal peristalsis, which uh, means that food's moving in the right direction. Instead of going up, it goes down, you know, so it's food this way. Um, and that helps. Uh, third thing is if it carries on happening, then it might be worth thinking about a different food as well because different dog has a large amount of fruit and veg in it. I think it's nearly 30%, which is very high for, for yeah. dogs. It is. It is very high. Um, we've got the Vitality Supplement has been amazing for Storm. Um, her fur is so thick now and she has it all over her stomach and on her legs. That's cool. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, are the supplements powdered or chewable? I can't get my dog to eat most, most powders uh, added to his food and no chewables. Uh, they are powdered. Uh, we use powders because... To put them in, to have them commercially put in capsules, you have to have a lubricant to stop the machines uh, kind of greasing or sticking up. So they put magnesium stearate and stearic acid in, which are chemicals linked to various health problems. So that's why we don't have them commercially put in capsules. Uh, and you have to put glues in to produce tablets. So again, you put. We don't want anything going into the supplements other than, than, than what's good for the dog. Yeah. So most people, will get, for the powders, they can get mixed into things like bone broth or, or live plain live yogurt. You know, uh, those are the two most popular ones. Um, if they really won't take them that way, you can buy a little capsule machine. You know, I've got one actually because I can't take the vitality as is, you know, or e even in yogurt. So I put... You get this little capsule machine. You buy empty capsules and you go like that and pass it down. Hey, prep, press it, and you've got you've got fifty capsules with the supplements in, and then you can just throw them down. And that's an easy way to disguise them. It's a little bit of a faff, but it's worth it for the health benefits because you know they're getting pure, high quality nourishment without any of the chemical additives that go into capsules and, and tablets. I mean, with Ron, anything sprinkled on a piece of raw. <laughs> And he he'll eat it basically. Um, but so Ron thoroughly recommends, you know, <laughs> broccoli floret, small one, sprinkle it on, and he's 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 quite happy to eat that. So, um, so okay, what else we got? Um, 
Ooh, ooh, ooh. Jamie said, Jamie's still here. She says, great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Someone said, I have a dog that has just had an op to remove kidney stones. We've been told we have uh, have to feed a food I'm not happy with. Uh, he is normally raw fed. Will I ever be able to go back to raw feeding with the right guidance? Uh, yeah, it has to be done on an individual basis, and it depends what the stone is. What What's the composition of the stone? Some can be influenced by diet, some not. Oh, there you go. Did the vet tell you? Did, did the vet tell you what it? What your kidneys? Your dog's kidneys? They should, I mean, well. as a matter of course, they should send them away for analysis, so you know, right. because diet is a, is an important way of preventing stones. So uh, they should should have done that. Absolutely. More information. Ask more questions there, I think. Um, if you know, then drop it in the chat and, and um, we'll uh, let Vince take a look. Um, someone has asked, what's your view on a dog getting toxoplasmosis from raw food? My vet said uh, his raw food was the most likely cause. We don't have any foxes or cats around the home, but can't say none. Uh, never seen a single case in 40 years. There's been a suspected one I've seen in a cat, uh, but I'm still not convinced it was the raw food. And don't forget, toxoplasmus, you can pick it up from soil and various other places. You know, raw food's not, not the only potential source. But all I can say is I've, I've never, in 40 years and 100,000 plus pets, I've, ne I've never seen a single case of toxoplasma in a, in, in a raw fed animal. But I've seen it in, I've seen it in um, pets on commercial pet food. That's so <laughs> I take it with a huge, huge pinch of salt. Yeah. And of course, yeah. you you can't tell. So I mean, somebody saying that they can't prove it. You know, it no. can't be proved either way. You know, but it, it's a it would be extremely rare in my experience. Okay, there you go. So it would have stopped me feeding my dog. It wouldn't stop wrong. me either, to be quite honest. Uh, both mine are on raw. Um, so kind of going back to kind of pain and, and things like that, whilst people put more questions in the chat for you. Um, complementary therapies. Um, so these are um, therapies that can be done in addition to um, obviously what the GP vet or first opinion vet and the uh, a holistic vet like Vince could um, could help you with. So um Complementary therapies, what I mean by that is these are therapies that are drug free and can help to rehabilitate a dog after a diagnosis. Um, but not only that, um, they can have a, an added benefit of, of reducing pain and discomfort in dogs. So um, you've studied acupuncture, Vince. So we start. Yeah, with that? I, used to use, uh, I, I used acupuncture when I was in practice. Um, it can be brilliant for spinal um, spinal issues and the secondary effects on nerves coming out of the spine in various places. So spinal um, spinal pain um, and gut issues secondary to uh, problems in the thoracolumbar area and also for bowel and bladder and toileting problems in the lumbar sacral, lower lumbar and the lumbar sacral area. It can be brilliant for that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to do for a vet. You know, I mean, you're only really looking at the bladder and gallbladder meridians that, that, uh, and it has a high success rate you, you know and, and a lot of the published studies uh, that prove the efficacy of acupuncture are on a musculoskeletal arthritic problems so it's well worth considering um i only use needles of course it's there's lasers and all sorts come out now but i i would still be tempted to use needles because they're so, it's so easy to do and most dogs tolerate them without they do i mean i mean i i credit with vince with being one of the, the very few people that my bulldog will let examine him especially after recent um a visit to a veterinary hospital where they nearly bloody killed my dog vince but that's oh, another story so that's that's uh yeah that's for another time i think um however ron is obviously uh, a little bit arthritic i mean he's nine years old now um i've noticed he's had remodeling going on in his left elbow you know from from an early age but he's had a uh, regular veterinary acupuncture now um by a lovely lady who again is one of the very few vets that can actually uh, so treat my dog and he loves her as well not as much as you obviously Vince but he, you know he, 
he takes all the love you know that he can get um and i find it amazing but not only that she's also treating points for um obviously intolerances because we know ron has a complete plethora <laughs> of um of, of being allergic to life as it were i think we'll say um and i found it hugely beneficial for him um you know just kind of like keeping on top of things so and he he definitely moves a lot better after he's had um, acupuncture with Lindsay as well. So it can be again drug free. A lot of people are um, you know might have had exper uh, bad experiences with with pain, conventional pain meds and things like that, and are looking for other options. Yeah. So um, acupuncture, fantastic, absolutely fantastic, and and should be explored definitely. Yeah. Um, don't stop after one session though. Give it a few sessions to see if. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to give it, you know, half a dozen sessions at least to make some kind of a judgment. Exactly. It has an accumulative effect, I find. And um, as with kind of like most things, I mean, we can talk about massage therapy as well. You know, yes, you can see some some positive results from the from the first session, but at least have a good three sessions you know, to, to, to ascertain whether or not this is going to be a, a good fit for your dog. Again, drug free hands on therapy. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about complementary therapies here that if your professional um, has had the right training, they will have in-depth knowledge of anatomy and physiology. And that is, I would say, really crucial and critical Mm. to really understanding what's going on with your dog you, that your therapist should have a, a big underpinning in that um you know there's many uh, massage therapy courses out there um, and professionals out there some are trained by the clinical canine massage therapy center garland or galen i, I think it's garland uh, myotherapy um icat there's marisha massage as well there's lots of different varieties out there and there's people that just specialize in massage therapy which is kind of what i used to do before moving on to the vet physio stuff and then we have uh veterinary physiotherapy so i'm um into small animal veterinary physiotherapy these days and advanced hydrotherapy um and a, a veterinary, veterinary physiotherapist will will kind of they do a lot of things, don't they, Vince? So they can do massage, they can do um, kind of fitness rehab kind of exercises for you. So they'll they'll do an exercise plan. Um, they will do um, PEM for a, a leg drop. Pulse electro electromagnetic therapy. They do <laughs> laser. They do red and blue light. Uh, shockwave therapy. Guess what? It's all drug free. You know, and actually it can help massively with a dog's um, comfort levels. Um, and, you know, normally with kind of these sorts of therapies, you have you might have weekly sessions for the first maybe six weeks and then they kind of get dropped down to to kind of maybe a, a monthly or bi-monthly or just a few sessions a year just to kind of for maintenance kind of purposes. So, um, it again, hugely beneficial. Hydrotherapy. I'm a massive fan of hydrotherapy, um, particularly aquatic treadmill, because you can target different joints and, you know, they're using the therapeutic properties of the water to help not only heal your dog, but obviously to improve your dog's core strength, to in uh, improve the way that the joint moves, to improve muscle tone, muscle bulk. It it's just it's amazing amazing therapy and it's all supportive so the the weight of the dog is is taken in the water so um they're much more freely able to move um and kind of actually do some therapeutic exercise in water it's a fantastic fantastic um uh, modality to to use so okay we've got um ooh. We've got uh, another question. So Claire, Claire's also a dynamic dog graduate. She says, do you recommend a regular worming treatment or regular worm count or both? I avoid the usual wormers from the vet and feed furry rabbit ears at the moment. But your comment about worms being more common than you think has sparked my interest. Yeah, we as, as a general rule, we advise doing the screening every three months with the the combined kits that, that we do. Um, most dogs rarely pick, but the great majority of dogs don't pick up worms at all. And what you're doing by that is you, you, you're making sure that they're not getting unnecessary chemicals and risking the side effects associated with them because all wormers are nerve poisons of one sort or another. Um, so they will inevitably 
uh, wreak havoc with the nervous system of sensitive pets. You know, it might might be small, but it happens to be your dog. Uh, that's not much conversation if your dog's convulsing or has fits and may have fits for the rest of their life. And uh, we do have people that have contacted us and they've given them a dose of Panicure and the dog's dead the day after. You know, so it does happen. Why take any unnecessary risks giving a, a chemical wormer if the dog is worm free anyway? You know, mm -hmm. um, so it's just good practice and good medicine and good sense not to give anything, not to put anything into your dog's body unless it's absolutely necessary. And only then if a natural alternative doesn't work. So we give, um, we advise regular uh, worm screening with the kits. Uh, we do a natural worm control remedy, which we which people give for uh, seven days at the beginning of every month. It's not a wormer, but it helps the body create a, an environment that's inhospitable to worms in the gut. So if they ingest uh, parasites, larvae or eggs, uh, the body's more likely to expel them before they gain control. So this is why it's control before they become established. Uh, so that's the general kind of um, rule. And that works for most dogs. Having said that, that, there are some wormers, there are some worming regimes that work if a dog does develop worms. You know, uh, we're, I mean, we're not allowed to put this out, out online or anything because otherwise the VMD get their knickers in a twist and say that we're, but, you know, making medicinal claims for our products and all the rest, which we don't. Uh, but of course, as a vet, you know, I'm I'm monitoring stuff and, and speaking to people individually and, and making suggestions. And if a dog, for example, gets a uh, whipworm or hookworm infection, if they if the, if the person uses our natural worm control, uh, so we have a regime, you know, we say go to your vet and get a chemical wormer or you can try this if you want to. And most people go for the natural option. So if they give the natural uh, worm control remedies for 10 days, along with organic crushed, freshly crushed organic pumpkin seeds, wait 10 days, repeat the whole thing. So far, every single case has been clear when they've been retested. And we can't we can't say that, you know, because. You've got to have clinical trials and you know all the rest of it, but there are so there are you know uh, as circumstances where the natural alternatives will work even if they do pick up worms, not for lung worm because that's in the lungs and heart and, and that's dangerous and you've got to get rid of them very quickly. But uh, and that's one of the advantages of using our kits because we provide all this um, professional advice free of charge, you know, which as you know vets charge an arm and a leg just for saying hello down the phone. Um, so that's uh, that's what we tend to recommend. Brilliant, fantastic. Do you that's see do you see less worms in naturally fed dogs than you do in kibble fed dogs? Uh, I couldn't really say actually because we don't know the the great majority of of the pets that submit for worm screening. We've got no idea what diet they're on. So we oh. can't, I can't really draw a conclusion. Oh, maybe you should ask that, like, just what, one little question. Can you tell us what our do your dog is fed on, like, as part of the <laughs> – I would find that fascinating. That would really – Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I might, yeah, I mean, it would be easy for us to do that, actually. I mean, I, I could, next time we were on the phone, yeah. we could put that on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of how we old do, we do see, We do see it reoccurring in certain areas. I mean, there are – some people who will test positive on a more regular basis, you know, if they're living in kind of very um, marshy terrain and there's lots of foxes and snails and snugs and all that, get, they tend to pick up lungworm, whereas other people never pick anything up, you know. So uh, geography and, and the terrain that the pets are living in or exercising on or whatever does, does play a big part. Yeah. Thankfully, Otis just rolls in fox poo. He's... <laughs> He's uh, um, that might deter the fleas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Honestly, he finds the biggest thing in the world, and then he looks at me with this big grin on his face, and then just kind of like you just see this leap in the air, and then he just kind of dumps his shoulder in it. I'm just like, great, that's that's going in my house now. That's fantastic. Uh, so Georgie, um, Georgie's asked, how many pumpkin seeds would you recommend for a 20 kilo beagle? About a teaspoon. Um, about a teaspoon of crushed per 10 kilos body weight. I was going to say crushed. Right you need to crush them because obviously it, it helps with you've the... Got to release, yeah, yeah, you've got to release the natural um, components of the pumpkin seed, which have a paralytic effect on uh, nematodes and other parasites. So 
yeah back so it, it's a teaspoon per 10 kilo so it'd be two teaspoons freshly crushed and you do that twice a day with the remedy twice a, with the uh detox remedies the worm control remedies intestinal cleanse and organ cleanse twice a day 10 days and then but if anybody wants that I ju just drop me a line and i'll email the protocol back i will make sure that i put all your details uh in the in the comments of this um on facebook events view so everybody knows how to get in touch with you if they um if they need yeah. you at all and two things before i forget um just re rewinding back to the body work um body works fabulous you know uh, for the reasons we talked about earlier with regards to uh, realigning the the skeleton that's so important because if, if you as long as you've got a mechanical problem the, the rest is limited. It's like if you've got you've not got the right diet, you can't build the right you, you can't build that. Everything's limited. Now, if you've got mechanical problems with the skeleton, you know you you can it can limit other therapies. So it can limit the potential even for acupuncture and this that and the other if you've got a gross misarticulation. So yeah. so for me, body work is really important early on. You know, and by body work, I, I mean I'm a great fan of, of, of canine massage, McTimony chiropractice, love it. Um, even before things like physiotherapy, because mm. if if you've got a, a misalignment and you're exercising and hydrotherapy, you've still got that misalignment there. So you're exercising a, a skeleton that, that is still out of sync. So get everything in sync in the right place. Then you build it up and strengthen it, and you're strengthening the muscles which hold everything in the correct positions. Yes. And, um, so that, yeah. that kind of just ties things up with the – almost like the three, three legs of a stool, you know, yeah. diet – emotional physiological kind of stuff and which is causes pain as much as anything else you know um Jim yeah. outlined that brilliantly early on that either pain or the perception of pain you know yeah. um that spider is not going to hurt you but if your mind thinks it's going to hurt you you the stress is painful you know yeah. uh, and then the so you've got the diet and the, the the mechanical issues the nutritional issues and then the emotional physiological issues and that provides the perfect solution if you're addressing those three areas. Yeah, absolutely. And and to kind of give a, an example of, of how, you know, if you can fix something mechanical, it can have a knock on effect elsewhere. Um, I actually saw a um, too many chiropractor with Ron, I think early on when, uh, when me and you first, when I first found you, should I say, praise the day. <laughs> and, um, and so, so yeah, he had a lingering ear infection and um, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to get a McTiermany chiropractor in. Um, and she found a large opposing misalignment of C2 in his neck. And she did all the, the lovely weird flicks and, and things that they do. And within a week, it, oh, it had drained. Amazing. And, and yeah. it was just incredible. And all of a sudden he was you know he was ear infection free um you know and we had to have regular treatments to make sure that that obviously because when you get a misalignment as vince said muscles and surrounding tissues fix it in place basically so you might need a couple of treatments this is why we say no just stop at one treatment have a few three to six kind of to kind of pop it i say pop it back in place flick all things back in place mctimony uh, chiropractor is really really gentle it's not bone cracking or anything like that it's super super gentle and you know i mean he's, he's never had that ear infection uh, how it was since he's had other issues but you know it, it was solved so again treat the mechanical and and you can you know potentially resolve other issues within the body as well so that i mean that that would have improved the lymphatic drainage from that side of the head but also the ventilation in the, the middle ear, you know, going up the eustachian tube from the back of the throat. So you're getting good ventilation and airflow. So, I mean, that's a really good illustration of, of the uh, the amplifying effect of correcting problems like that. Yeah. Uh, before I forget, uh, there's so many side effects with all these drugs and this, that, and the other. And uh, I don't know what you know, but we launched our academy a few weeks ago, our online academy. There's a free course on there. We only put it up this week. Literally, it's only a short thing. It's a, it's a video, 15-minute video and an ebook with important links um, called check, Checking for Chemicals. So if anybody wants to enroll on that while it's free, head over there and uh, – and just and it, it it just shows you how you can check veterinary data sheets for the side effects on 
any drug whatsoever and it's really important and then pass that on to clients you know tell clients well you know if, this, if you're giving your dog this ju just just have a look you know and very often that inspires people to move away from that from medication that's potentially harmful yeah and and maybe kind of not reach for it reach for it as readily as maybe they had done previously yeah. um yeah. for sure okay amazing thank you so much vince i'm gonna let you go um and it's just been brilliant speaking to you again as it always is um i could talk to you for hours and hours and hours i absolutely watch it draw on for hours <laughs> <laughs> We'll invite you back to do another one. We'll we'll ask the group what they'd um what they'd like to, to chat to you about, and we'll get you back uh, in a month or so for for another chat because I'm sure everyone would want to to ask you more questions about different things. We'll have a bit of a think for you and see what um wonderful topics we can come up with for next time. Okay, all right, everybody. We'll see you again soon. But um, yeah, thanks for joining us, and and thank you, Vince. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening.